What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. A quick reminder, all the links for the stories you're about to see are now in the Swift News GitHub link repo. Uh, so the link to that will be in the description. All right, let's throw up the rundown and get into the show. First up, we finally got those details for the App Store Small Business Program. I'm gonna go through this kind of quick because I've covered this a lot. I did a whole video on it, um, but I'm gonna touch on the new pieces of information that we got with this more information post. And if you're new to this, you're not familiar with this, basically if you make less than a million dollars, Apple's taking their 30% cut down to 15%. That's the super high level. Click the link to dive into the details. Again, I'm just gonna cover like the new stuff here. So the new information is, uh, developers must identify an associated developer accounts to determine the eligibility. So why do you need to you know, disclose all your associated accounts? Well, they wanna make sure that like you are in fact a small business. You didn't just create a new developer account for all of your 10 different apps and they're all bucketed separately. So you do have to disclose like all of your accounts. So that's one uh, big thing there. App transfers. App transfers are not allowed while participating in the program. Well, I mean, you can still transfer your app, but if you transfer the app, you're out of the small business program and you're back to that like 30%. Uh, enrolling is simple, right? We were wondering if everybody got this automatically or you had to enroll. Well, here you go. Clearly you have to enroll. Uh, the big thing here is uh, the deadline, December 18th of 2020. So like 10 days from now, not long. <laughs> so if you are releasing an app in 2021 or you already have an app out there and you want to qualify for this, definitely, definitely enroll. Because at least from my understanding, like if you don't enroll by December 18th of 2020, like you're waiting until 2022 to get this 15% instead of 30%. So it's very important that you enroll by the 20, uh, I'm sorry, the 18th of December. Again, at least that's how I understand it. Happy to be wrong. If I am wrong, correct me. Uh, and then we have some uh, frequently asked questions uh, about this program. Feel free to dive in. I know one big question is like, well, how do I know if I have an associated developer account, right? Because some people may have an LLC or a business and their personal account, all that sort of stuff. Well, they do give you the parameters here to let you know like what actually is an associated developer account so you know what you need to disclose. So again, that's the details on the Apple's uh, small you know, business program. The big thing is just uh, make sure you apply by the 18th. You got about 10 days. Next up, we have a nice little tool by James Dempsey, uh, the Swift version. And that's really all it is. You need you see the current version, what Xcode it supports, you can see what's in development, and then the history, right? Sometimes I've, I don't know, at least for my videos, I wanna say, oh yeah, Swift 4.0 came out in this year, this date. Well, you can go back in history and see, look, Swift 4.0 came out September 19th, 2017. When did Swift 2 come out, right? Uh, that was a big one. Uh, September 21st of 2015. Swift 1.2 was my first like, big breaking change release. I remember all my code broke in Swift 1.2. I was just learning how to code and that was like my first experience of like, oh crap, this thing's changing. Uh, so I have fond memories of Swift 1.2, but again, that was April of uh, 2015. So again, just a quick little tool to give you the history and the Xcode versions um, of the Swift releases. Moving on, Apple has announced the uh, App Store Best of 2020 winners. And if you are, you know, an indie app developer or just developing all apps, it's it's nice to take a look at some of these apps to see like what's winning awards, right? And see, you know, what styles or, or themes or types of apps that you can maybe get inspired by to incorporate into yours. Another thing, this is pretty cool, right? You get this nice aluminum like trophy, like that's that's goals right there. That's pretty cool to have that on your shelf. But um, there's not a ton of information about all these apps. Uh, it's just kind of scroll through and get some screenshots and see what apps won. Like this is the best iPhone app, Wake Out. Looks like a simple workout you can do. Uh, iPad app of the year, Zoom. Of course, Zoom blew up this year. Fantastical, always a great one. But again, you can just kind of scroll through, see what won, uh, you know, which award, look at the screenshots, maybe you can get inspired for your own app. Moving on, we have some big news from Jordan Morgan in Spenstack. Now, I feature Jordan a lot because he's been sharing his, as you can see the title here, right? The Indie Dev Diaries, right? He's been sharing his journey as an indie developer with Spenstack. Well, the Spenstack journey for him has come to a close because uh, it got acquired, which is always kind of like, maybe not always an end goal for all indie developers, but that's a very common end goal because usually that's a pretty nice payout, one would assume. Um, but the what I liked about Jordan's article here and him sharing this is he shares you know, what happened, why it happened, how it happened, all that good stuff. And as you can see here, his whole LLC, Dreaming and Binary, has been acquired. There's a reason for that, because he was using CloudKit with SpendStack to get that nice syncing. Kind of a downside of with these Apple uh, developer accounts, like if you use CloudKit, you, you, have, you can't just sell the app, you have to sell the whole account. So if you're building an app and you know you're gonna use CloudKit, maybe you wanna create a separate LLC, a separate developer account, 
if if you ever intend on like maybe one day selling it, it's nice to have that completely compartmentalized. And he talks a, a bit about that throughout this article. But I want to talk about like the why, because that's kind of an important part, right? And he goes through the whole thing. Um, again, definitely check it out. It's a long, in-depth article, especially if you're an indie developer that's really interested in this. Like I said, I love that Jordan uh, shared this. But this is kind of what happens to, to all successful apps, right? For the past year, Spen, SpenStack has done something pesky on me. It's grown, right? And, and Jordan still has a full-time job. He's doing the indie dev thing uh, on the side. So as the app gets bigger, like his, you know, he only has a finite amount of time. Uh, another thing that happens to all of us, right? Uh, and through it all, the unthinkable happened. My passion to keep this spend stack train chugging started waning, right? And we've all been there, right? Where you're, you're super pumped about a project for many, many years. And then maybe you start to get less enthusiastic. And for Jordan, like that was a good time to consider, you know, selling the app. You know, his time was limited, his passion started waning. So an acquisition was a, was a good thing here. And then he talks about, uh, you know, the how, basically how you can find people, you know, to acquire your app potentially, how it all happened. He talked about the whole cloud kit thing and selling the whole LLC, you know, caused some issues, but they worked through it. But anyway, definitely check out this article from Jordan about uh, the acquisition of Spendstack. Sticking with the indie dev train, right? A comprehensive guide to app pricing strategies and tools. And again, this is a longer article, but I want to focus on like one idea that's kind of towards the top. And, and again, he, he even says it right here, uh, you know, pricing is also a topic that is infinitely deep. I mean, pricing's hard. Like you can read all these guides all you want, but you know, there is no like one size fits all pricing strategy, right? It's very unique to you and your business and your customer. There's so many different strategies. Like it's, it's difficult, um, but guides like this can help. So scrolling down, the, the one thing I want to touch on here is this Chichpa uh, extreme self-confidence or, or audacity. And it's because like, you know, through over the decade of the app store, right? It's been a race to the bottom on prices. Like, you know, developers as a collective have trained their users to like not want to pay for an app. Like if you have to pay for it, like, you know, back in like the 90s, early 2000s, paying 50 to $100 for a piece of software was like the norm. Now paying 99 cents is just like scoffed at. So, and we've kind of trained our users for that. But anyway, this addresses that a little bit. Like don't gatekeep yourself from making money. Here's the key line. Let the market decide if your prices are fair. And pretty much no matter what you price your app app, even if it's 99 cents, like you're gonna get reviews or emails saying like, this should not be 99 cents, right? It doesn't matter what you price it at, you're gonna get a couple angry customers. It's just gonna happen. Again, one person's opinion is not the market, right? So let the market decide if your prices are fair. Now, if you have a thousand users and 700 of your thousand users are emailing you telling you this is too expensive, that's probably the market speaking. Or if you're not selling anything, that's probably the market speaking. But the key thing here is don't let the small percentage of loud users like dictate your prices, like pay attention to what's actually happening. And then the last point I want to touch on on this, again, this is a long guide. If you if you have an app you're selling, definitely read it. It's worth your time for sure. Um, I just don't want to spend too much time on it because I, I could probably do a whole video on it. But anyway, like it, it's okay to ask your users to pay for your product. It's even okay to ask your users to pay a lot of money for it, right? There's nothing wrong with making a thousand dollar a year product. Here's the key if it provides $1,000 worth of value. And that $1,000 number is just a placeholder, insert whatever dollar amount you want. But the, the key note is, right, like what value are you providing your users and are you charging like a fair price for that value? And that's the thing, like we're so used to charging like 99 cents or even 4.99 for an app, like that's crazy expensive. But if you're delivering tons of value, like charge the appropriate amount. Here's an example, like the app I'm working on, the, the Creator View app, that is targeted for content creators, YouTubers, podcasters, Twitch live streamers, whatever, that are making a living off of their content, right? That's not for the hobbyist. So I plan on charging 15 to $20 a month. Now for a consumer app, that sounds ridiculous. But my goal is to make a, an invaluable tool for somebody running their business, right? I'm making the tool for me. If the tool that I have in mind existed, I would love to pay $20 a month to use it because I'm getting way more than $20 worth of value uh, from that. So that's just kind of an example of, you know, price appropriately for the value you're providing and for the type of customer, right? Like, for example, my app, like I'm working with other businesses. So B2B, business to business, you know, that pricing strategy is completely different than building like a, a mass consumer app. And then finally, because I could talk about this stuff forever, uh, the last thing I want to point out, never assume that you know how the market will react to certain pricing. Try things, gauge the reaction, and then adjust accordingly. Like, this is all one big experiment and iteration. Like, again, pricing's hard. 
Next, we have a tweet from Kevin here that uh, is also a snippet from the Under the Radar podcast. And it's talking about like workflows, right? I'll read Kevin's tweet. Uh, this is incredibly important. You do not need to be a beast in regularity slash productivity to build great products. He works in bursts. Uh, in his case, it's weeks and not in days. Uh, and I thought it was bad until Marco talked about this on Under the Radar. Okay, so that was the tweet. Basically saying that like, you know, I, I fall into this. this. This really resonated with me. That's why I wanted to share it is, uh, you know, three days out of the week, I'll feel like a bum. I'll tinker around. I may get a little bit of stuff done. And then randomly on like a Thursday night, I'll just go crazy and work for like six straight hours and be insanely, insanely productive. And what Kevin here and what Marco Arman is talking about on the Under the Radar snippet, it's about two minutes long. Uh, I definitely recommend, you know, clicking on it and, and listening to it. I can't play it here. But uh, it just talks about that, you know, getting into a flow state as a developer, right? I'm sure we've all been there where you're just in the flow. Next thing you know, five hours go by. You're like, what, why is it dark out? <laughs> you know, like we've all been there and talks about how, like, don't worry if you're not there each and every day from, you know, nine to five, the normal working hours, right? The inspiration, the flow, it just comes in bursts. And Marco talks about how he'll go four days being like zero productivity and then just one day go nuts and get like an entire week worth of work done in one day. So it's not necessarily recommend working like that and not working like that. I, I guess the point here is that like, if you do feel like that, um, a lot of people do as well. Like I said, I feel like a bum a lot of days that I'm not getting enough done. And then I get a lot done in one day. And, and I think the point here is that a lot of people are like that. Moving on, I wanted to share a pretty neat tool from Boris M here called uh, Color Kit. And essentially what this does is it looks at an image and it pulls out the dominant colors in that image to create a color palette. Now, why would you use this? Well, we've all seen this in like uh, music playing apps, right? Where it's nice how you see you can have a different background color. The text can be a different color, all based on, you know, the colors that it pulls out of the image. So it looks good. And, you know, you can make sure you have the proper contrast ratio and all that stuff uh, with this tool. So again, if you're creating something like this where you want your background to be dynamic based on like what's actually in the image. I think we've all seen that with like the blurry background kind of look. Um, but anyway, I thought this was pretty cool. Uh, color kit will just pull out the color palette for you, finding the dominant colors, and then you can use that accordingly. Moving on to AR Corner, this one, this one's insane from Matt Berner here. Uh, again, we talk about the acid trip of AR, that's kind of my, my running thing here, but like basically this, I'll skip through. The real world is like being distorted based on like his voice as he speaks, or the music playing. Uh, I'm trying to find the, the spot to where like the music changes. So like as the music's playing, like the ripple, yeah, there you go. Like the bass is really hitting hard now. That's nuts. Imagine just walking down the road and like seeing this and he has other like wave visualizers based on the, you know, the music. Uh, I thought that was, that was insane. Again, I, I've said it a thousand times, just AR is gonna be one giant acid trip. And finally, the LOL of the week here, uh, the handover, we've all been there, right? And as I'm phasing out of my consulting projects, this one's really hitting close to home. Uh, this is my code. It's your problem now. I'm out. <laughs> I think we've all been there. Anyway, that wraps it up for this week's episode. Uh, we'll see you in the next one.